So uh, I'm, I'm Zach Picard and I work for the for EPA, the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And uh, I'm in charge of designing the risk assessment for PM NACS along with the team of uh, folks that I work with. I was asked to provide a little background for the basis for our selection of the concentration response function used in the national scale risk assessment. And then to talk a little bit about the way that we've attempted to characterize or assess our confidence in the, in the risk estimates that are generated using that, that uh, response function. So once again, um, I'm focusing here on the national scale risk assessment in support of the, of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard Review for PM. And I'm going to talk about long-term mortality estimate, which is what I think our, our discussion is here. Uh, so next, please. So the goals of the risk assessment are first to assess, uh, the, to characterize the nature and the magnitude of public health impacts from long-term exposure to PM to public health. Now, again, this is at the national level. The way we do that is part of the, Nash, of, of the NACS review. Let me stop for a second and actually realize that I wanted to set this up a little bit. We're, we're reviewing the NACS standard right now for PM, for particulate matter. We're in the, pr the process of reviewing that. The risk assessment that I'm going to talk about, we just completed a second draft of that risk assessment that is currently open for public review. So if people have comments on the analysis, they can submit those. And in early March, we're actually going to be having a peer review meeting with the, the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, which is our peer review group, to discuss the design and issues related to the PM NACS. So just to provide, provide that, that background real quick. So back to this. Um, so for the, the risk assessment is designed to characterize the nature and magnitude of public health impacts from PM 2.5. We do that by modeling a number of urban study areas. LA is one of the study areas, but these include cities throughout the country. There are 15 of the cities. Obviously, the second part of that is to try to assess our overall confidence or to characterize uncertainty in that estimate of risk. It's probably pretty important this, given the discussion here. And then finally, we try to evaluate the degree to which the estimates that we generate are representative of the broader nation. So we've modeled 15 cities. Obviously, there are more than 15 large cities in the US. So one of the questions is, how representative are the urban areas that we've modeled of the rest of the country, urban areas in the country? Next, please. So when we conduct the risk assessment at the national level, we generate two types of risk estimates. We generate a core set of estimates, and what we've done here is looking at the literature, and it's all the literature we've been talking about today. We identify the set of studies or the study that we think we have the greatest confidence in. That's a qualitative assessment that the EPA staff makes. Then we bring that assessment before KSAC, which is a peer review group with a number of members here, and we get, also get feedback from, from the public on this. And based on that, we generate, we extract concentration response functions, which I'll briefly talk about, from that, that course study, and we use those as a simulator to estimate long-term mortality risk for a number of different health endpoints. That's our core estimate. And so if you imagine a series of risk estimates here going from low risk to high risk, several of these, the two red dots, represent the core risk estimates that we generate. The other set of estimates that we generate are, are we conduct a sensitivity analysis to generate a set of additional analyses. While we may, and I'll talk about this in a second, we may have greater confidence in one of the EPI studies for reasons I can explain. Obviously, there's merit. There's a number of other studies have support in, in the community and in the literature. So we use additional epidemiology studies and extract concentration response functions from those studies and generate an additional set of risk estimates. Now, not to get too technical here, but this does not represent a, an uncertainty distribution. What we haven't done is tried to put confidence weights on each of the study, studies and generate a whole set of risk estimates that give you a confidence distribution, meaning here's our best estimate, here's a 90th percentile or a 95th percentile. We haven't done that. You do that by, by uh, conducting a probabilistic, a Monte Carlo analysis, basically, but in order to do that, as I just explained, you have to be able to take a look at each one of your studies and the concentration response functions and put a confidence level on that. That was done to a certain extent in a certain context within the expert elicitation, which was mentioned earlier today. But that analysis, that, that work has, is now a few years old. So what we did given time is we essentially generated two core estimates, a set of additional risk estimates, and together those represent a range of risk estimates that, that management can look at. Am I speaking too quickly? No. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is just provide a little bit of background on, on, on the core uh, epidemiology studies that, and, and concentration response, response functions that we selected and why, and then a little bit of detail on the additional set of analyses that were used in the sensitivity assessment. 
So for the core, for selecting the core study, we went with the Kruski 2009 extension of the ACS study, which has been discussed a lot here. Our reasons for that are points that have been made earlier. And, and once again, I'll just emphasize the fact we're conducting a national analysis. We're considering this in the broader context of the nation, so just to, to be clear about that. So uh, it included extended air quality analysis up to 18 years. It had rigorous examination of a range of concentration response functions. A lot of that stuff gets fairly technical, but there were some new things in terms of looking at random effects, the potential clustering of data. We were talking about that that I think was, was done to a certain extent in the, for the first time in this particular version of the analysis, a range of ecological variable control, a consideration of exposure time windows. The fact that that study attempted to look at that didn't find a lot of differences between those windows, but the look at that we thought was valuable. And then finally, the fact that as the basis or sort of the sub-analyses of this larger national scale analysis, we included, uh, we, uh, they included the study design, uh, study, study authors included a look at LA in detail and New York City in detail, also provided us with additional support that that data set in a comprehensive way included some dimensions that we really liked. And then fi finally, it's a very large data set, which is just described here. Okay, so then now that we've selected the Kruski 2009 uh, study, anybody who's looked at that study knows it's uh, 150 pages, 160 pages. It's a very detailed analysis. There are many, many concentration response functions uh, presented in that analysis. I think it's one of the strengths. That's where that, that's exactly right, which I did look at. Um, and so we, we spent a fair amount of time looking at which of the concentration response functions we should really use from that analysis. Ultimately, we went, and this gets sort of techy, but just to sort of put it out there, we went with the Cox model with adjust, adjustment for the ecological covariates. That's something that we've talked about a little bit here. The reason we went for that concentration response function was it allowed us to define that concentration response function based on two air quality periods. Now, I think a point was made earlier that the effect estimates were not that different from these two exposure periods. And I would say if you run incidence numbers for a large city like New York with those two effect estimates, you get differences of 1,000 deaths in a year, potentially. So the point is that these effect estimates run for the different air quality periods from a public health assessment standpoint could be significant. So we, rather than selecting one or the other, have a response functions or, uh, excuse me, effect estimates, concentration response functions for both of those air quality time periods. And uh, just to mention this, the, the entire risk assessment approach was reviewed by KSAC a, a few months ago when we received support, and obviously a lot of comments and, and, and suggestions which we're working on, but broad su support for the selection of these concentration response functions. And then just to be clear, we did consider the inclusion of one of the more sophisticated models without getting into a lot of detail. It's the random effects model, which allows that, that clustering, that, that covariance to be looked at. And the reason we didn't go for it as the core analysis was because we couldn't define it for both of those exposure periods. It wasn't specified like that in, in the study. So next. So now, and I only have two more slides. I'm supposed to be short on this. So uh, for the sensitivity analysis, we wanted to include additional concentration response functions from the Kruski study because we felt there were other dimensions that should be included. So we did include a log log where you have the log of the effect and the log of PM. That gives you a steeper slope. So we included one of those models. And we also included uh, the random effects model defined for one of the exposure time periods that was given. We also included Kruski 2000 because that allowed us to look at the six city study. We considered using Leyden, but I don't know if this point has been made. Leyden, you, the air quality, the PM 2.5 data, data for Leyden is based on visibility estimates, and we didn't want to go with a sort of an interpolated um, metric like that. We wanted to use direct PM 2.5 data. Might point out that's for the follow up of. That's that's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then, if I can uh, go all the way back to the second slide. Uh, next one, so it's the third slide. So just to point out, this, this plot actually is the set of estimates that was generated, I believe, for IHD mortality. And I don't have numbers down here, but the point that I wanted to make was generally we selected a core set of estimates, generated it, then we had additional sensitivity analysis estimates around that, and what we found was 
most of those sensitivity analysis results where we used other viable models ended up giving us actually higher risk estimates than what our core estimates were. So that's just, I think, a point to make. There were a number of studies that we've mentioned here that we couldn't use in the risk assessment because we don't have baseline incidence data or other things you need to run risk estimates for. But those will be considered as part of the evidence analysis, which is a very critical part of this whole decision, which is sort of a, a side, a second part of the review that I'm not going to talk about. So.